Hello, I'm Menno Schildhuizen. I'm from Naturalis Biodiversity Center, Leiden, the Netherlands. And I've just written this book. Um, it's called Darwin's Peep Show, and it's all about the evolution of genitalia. And that's where, why Maria Fernanda Cardozo asked me to tell you um, about this book in a nutshell in the next 15 minutes. Now, genitalia are... Um, are very interesting organs. I mean, obviously, they're very interesting. We, we find them interesting, but also for evolutionary biologists, they're very interesting. Um, but let me first tell you what a biologist calls genitalia, because that's not always um, the same across different kinds of animals. I mean, we, we think we know what our genitals are, and I think we, we're, we're probably right about that. But many other animals have um, different organs that they use to transfer sperm. Think of spiders, for example. Spiders, um, male spiders, have little boxing glove-like hands on either side of their head, and when they want to to mate, they um, they make a little a little miniature web, and they deposit a droplet of sperm in the web from their from their regular genital opening, and then they use these little boxing gloves to suck up the sperm from that sperm web, it's actually called a sperm web, and then first with one and then with the other one, and then with these two boxing gloves filled with sperm, they start looking for a female spider, and then when they meet a female spider, they push this boxing glove underneath her and squirt the sperm into her, and then with the other, the other boxing glove. So um, a spider doesn't use, a male spider doesn't use its regular genitals to, to inseminate a female, it uses these, these hand-like things on both sides of its head. And velvet worms uh, are another example. Velvet worms are very, very peculiar um, animals. They look a bit like very soft millipedes, like millipedes in romper suits. Basically, that's what they look like. Um, and many of them live in the Australian rainforest. And not too long ago, an entomologist called Noel Tate described, he discovered a lot of new species of velvet worms from the nightcap range um, and he found that the males in these velvet worms all had very strange shapes on their heads. They had spikes and prongs and there was a species that had sort of a flower-like arrangement on its head and he didn't know what they did with these structures on their head until he found a pair of them mating. And then he saw that the male, which in this species had a, had a, a three-pronged spine on the top of its head, carried a package of sperm, of its own sperm, on those spines, on its head, like a crown, and was um, shoving it in the backside of a female. So, in a velvet worm, by definition, its genitals are on its head, because that's what it uses to transfer the sperm. So there's lots of different kinds of organs that could, um, could function as genitals in, in all these strange animals that, that we know in the world. Um, now let me go back to um, to Paris first. Paris um, is the place where an entomologist called René Janel worked and lived about a hundred years ago. And um, a few years ago I spent some time looking around the gardens of the Paris Natural History Museum looking for the statue of Chanel and it's, eventually I found it hidden behind some bushes and it was it was sort of a pilgrimage for me because René Chanel is the founding father of genital uh, science. He wrote a whole lot of books, he wrote 20,000 pages in his life altogether and most of them are a bit like this. This is one of his books uh, this one is about a group of a family of beetles, and you show you see all these pictures of rows and rows of beetle penises. That's what these are, and they all look different. If you look closely, you see that every shape of every species is is very different from the next species. So in these beetles, the genitalia, the penises of these males, are a better way to distinguish the species than the rest of the body is. Uh, and Chanel was one of the first people to really, um, to really understand that. Um, now, what does that mean? It means that evolution 
works the fastest in these genital organs. Evolution of genitalia is much faster, it's much more rapid, it's much more wildly diversifying than evolution in legs or in livers or in, in antennae of these beetles, because they are pretty much all the same between species, but the genitalia are different. Um, now, since Janel, a lot of taxonomists, and taxonomists are the, the kind of biologists who classify species and who look for differences between species and who discover new species, they have been using these genitalia to, um, to distinguish species and to recognize them. So they've known that there are these big differences between species, but they've never really wondered about why this would be. What is the reason that evolution is so fast and so strong in, in these genitalia? Until, um, that is, uh, Bill Eberhardt, an American biologist in 1985, so not that long ago, um, published a book called Sexual Selection and Animal Genitalia. And in it, he, he pointed out for evolutionary biologists that these taxonomists, these people who have been describing all these species, had discovered something really interesting. That apparently, if we un want to, to understand sexual selection and evolu sexual evolution, we should really look at those genitalia of all these, all these obscure animals that taxonomists have been, have been discovering and describing. And he said, well, if you're looking at these, these identification books with all these plates full of differently shaped genitals, it's basically uh, similar to what, you're, what you see when you look at, um, at a bird guide, for example. Here is um, a field guide of uh, birds from Malaysia, and you see all these flycatchers, and all the males, these are all the males with these blue colorful patterns, and the, the, the color patterns of every species is different in the males, but the females are all sort of a drabish brown, they all look pretty much the same. Um, and if you're looking at uh, grasshoppers, the males produce songs with their, with their legs by rubbing them against the wings. And if you're if you're buying a, this is a, a book that describes all the grasshoppers from uh, from the Netherlands, and for some species you see or for some kinds of grasshoppers you see all these rows of sonograms which are little little diagrams that show what sort of song this species makes and you see that all these different species of grasshopper make different songs. And since Darwin's book, um, the descent of man and selection in relation to sex, we know that this is the, the result of sexual selection, that females select um, characteristics, outlandish, uh, very striking uh, characteristics of males, uh, which they prefer um, to mate with and to have their eggs fertilized by. Um, and this can be songs, this can be colors, this can be all kinds of ornaments. And Bill Eberhardt said, well, um, maybe it's all these genital shapes are just an extension of that. Maybe those are basically internal courtship devices, that the males use them and the, the, all the structures on it are registered by the females and they, um, they like it or they dislike it and they select males partly on the basis of the shape of these male genitalia. Uh, now that's an interesting idea, of course. Um, but how can, how can females register that? Um, I mean, there are some species where the males display their, their penis. There's, uh, there are fish, uh, pisciliate fish, like the, the guppy, for example, and uh, mosquito fish, which are all members of that family. And there the males um, display their, their penis. It's called a gonopodium in these fish, but it's basically a penis. Um, they display it in front of the female, and the female selects a male on the basis of how the penis looks. But most of the time, at least not in these beetles, for example, um, the female doesn't see the male's penis, so she has to feel it somehow. Um, are females able to, to, to sense that? Well, we think they are. Um, there are some very striking examples of, um, of crane flies, which actually have um, files and scrapers on their penis with which they can make a sort of a vibrating singing sensation which surely the female must must be feeling when she mates with the male but even species that don't have these these singing penises they have all kinds of flanges and knobs 
which the female may be able to, to register. Um, so it might be that evolution of genitalia works the same way as the evolution of color patterns. But you might wonder, well, this doesn't make sense. I mean, how can a female select a male once she's already mated with, with the male? Then it's too late to still make a choice. Um, well, yes and no. It's, um, females have a lot of sophisticated ways of selecting males, preferring and, and, and not preferring males, even after they've mated with them. For example, they can store sperm. Human females can't store sperm very long, but most uh, animals can. Bats, for example, uh, some of whom are, might be flying uh, across the window here. Um, bats mate in autumn in, in, um, in temperate climates. And the females store the sperm and then they hibernate and only in spring they use the sperm to fertilize the males. Um, they can store sperm of separate males in separate places. These, these uh, garden snails, for example, they have little separate tubules in which they store sperm. So maybe they can even store sperm of separate males separately and use it separately to fertilize their eggs. Um, and then there are lots of internal locks and valves, for example. Um, in pigs, uh, this, this thing here, which you may have seen in the background already, is, a, is a, um, an instrument that is used for artificial insemination in pigs. Um, now, initially, they, they, this corkscrew tip wasn't in it. The early versions of this were simply a long pi pipette, which they used to squirt sperm into a, uh, a female pig. Um, to artificially inseminate it, but they figured out that it didn't often didn't work very well until they put this corkscrew on it, and this is the exact shape that the penis of a, a male pig has, of a boar, and then suddenly uh, the fertilization rate increased. Apparently the females like this corkscrew shape, uh, and they have sort of internal mechanisms to then use sperm that came from a corkscrew shaped um, artificial inseminator. So um, those are those are different mechanisms that females have to select sperm of different males, and and even if they didn't have that, then they still have the option of uh, selective abortion. Um, it's known that in in mice, for example, uh, there is a phenomenon uh, known as uh, the Bruce effect. Now, for Australians, this may um, sound as if females select against the kind of males who are named Bruce. But in fact, it's named after um, a zoologist, uh, Martha Bruce, who, um, who discovered this in the 1950s. She found that um, females sometimes abort all her embryos um, at will when they meet uh, a male that's even better than the male that, that uh, fathered those embryos. So even with uh, autonomous abortion, they can select between males. Um, now, this whole system of, of females selecting uh, genitalia, shapes of males uh, in different ways is called cryptic female choice. Um, cryptic because you can't see it on the outside, it all happens inside the female. But there's a twist. Um, and the twist is that, um, for example, in many of these beetles, you see that there are not just flanges on the, on the penis, there's actually spines, there's very hard and sharp needles on it which surely can't be feeling very nice people have suggested that maybe this is some sort of stimulation for the female but well you'd be hard-pressed to to imagine a female that actually likes that sort of stimulation and um, Gern Arnqvist uh, a Swedish entomologist discovered what they're for he used uh, bean weevils which are little seed beetles that feed on seeds um, and he fed the males radioactive beans. Now the radioactivity ended up in its body and also in the semen, that the, the sperm that, uh, that um, the weevil produced. And when it then mated with a female, he could figure out that the radioactivity didn't just end up in the vagina of the female, it also ended up in the bloodstream of the female. Um, and then he did a very clever trick. He he, he uh, used a laser to burn off those spines that these bean weevils have on their penis and then 
replicated the experiment and he found out that the radioactivity doesn't go into the blood of the female. So apparently these spines actually puncture the skin of the, the internal skin of the vagina so that the semen leaches into the, the bloodstream of the female. Now we know, we think we know why this is because in many insects, semen is not just liquid with sperm, it's liquid with sperm and hundreds of different proteins. Uh, and you can see actually, if you, if you make a, a molecular biology gel, you see all these bands, you see that there are hundreds of different kinds of proteins in semen, which all seem to be doing something. And we know from experiments in, in fruit flies that what they do is they, they do some sort of um, chemical warfare on the female psychology. Uh, some of these proteins actually are anti-aphrodisiacs. They, um, they act on the, on the banana fly's brain to, um, to prevent her from mating again. So they reduce her sex drive uh, so that she doesn't mate again. And of course that's good for the male that has produced those proteins. So uh, she gets to fertilize all her eggs with his sperm. Um, and there are other, other ways in which the genitalia can do things, of the genitalia of the male can do things that are not so nice for the female. And this is not called cryptic female choice, this is called sexually antagonistic co-evolution. And at the moment there's a whole debate going on between those two schools, so some saying it's, it's more um, sexual antagonistic co-evolution and some other people say it's more cryptic female choice. Um, it looks like both things are going on and in fact what you see in these in these books is where you have this whole diversity is just uh, the end result of a sort of evolutionary tango where um, both of these kinds of evolution take place and well we humans are just one little twinkle in, an, in a whole universe of constellations of possibilities in the evolution of genitalia and and that's I think why biologists are so fascinated by them.